Who do you say that I am? When I think of myself, I know exactly what you see. Every flaw, every blemish, the scars of my hurts and my mistakes, the things I've done to myself, the things that have been said and done to me, that's who I am. You see a mother, a daughter, a sister, an aunt. You see the scarce shadow of a woman's potential irreversibly wrapped in failure. But then I hear it that still, small voice. Who told you that? Who told you that you are defined by your mistakes? Who told you that you are ugly and broken? Who told you that you are only measured by what you give others? Who told you that brokenness and frailty are what you carry? Haven't you heard? You are not what everyone says you are. You are who God says you are, and you are His. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says you are a perfect design, made for a purpose, made for a destiny, and you are never alone. He says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He goes before you. He goes behind you. He says you are bold. He says you are brilliant. He says you are brave. He says greater is he that is in you. You are a masterpiece, hand-painted by the master himself. You are who God says you are. Uh, last week, um, and I'm just going to build off a little bit of Dave's message last week. Last week he talked about uh, um, belief. And that, there's a belie- that we need to believe in others so that we, we can have a more fulfilled life. I think that was the takeaway last week. That a belief in Jesus can have eternal qu- consequences. Um, he shared some great stories and was transparent about what was going on in his life. And, and Dave, if you've been here, know uh, that he has been very transparent over the last little while about what's been going on in his life. And we love him for that and we support him as the pastor of this church, as our spiritual leader. He's just an amazing guy uh, that he can actually just stand up here and just be real with y'all. But he needed to know that others believed in him and that in turn gave him the energy to know that uh, He needs to keep going, that he needs to keep doing this work that God has called him to do. And it's not an easy task, I can tell you. I just do a little bit of uh, his job, and uh, I can't imagine full-time what that looks like. And I know there's a few people in here that can, people that have been in ministry know what that's like. If it's a full-time job, it's just not easy. So we need to continue to support Dave. uh, Can we do that as a church? Yeah, that's great. Today... um, Today, I've heard it called Promise Sunday. Today would be Palm Sunday if you're uh, from a more orthodox uh, um, church. Uh, this, is the day, uh, um, this is the day that starts kind of Jesus' last week here on earth, walking as a, um, flesh and blood and breathing and living human being. This uh, today would start a celebration in, in his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, palm leaves being laid before him, people throwing things. It was, it was uh, fit for a king coming through. But then as we go into this week, uh, we see, among other things, uh, that he's cursed a fig tree, and there's a story that goes along that. He's overturned t- uh, tables in a temple. He traveled uh, a bit and, and had his last supper and was betrayed. He was killed by the end of the week. And he knew going into it that it was going to be crazy. He knew that behind him was his sermons and ahead was some suffering. His suffering. Behind him was his parables. Ahead of him was his passion. Behind him fellowships and meals with friends. And ahead of him his last supper and ultimate betrayal. Behind him the delights of this world and ahead of him a darkest enemy. 
fulfilling prophecy is all that lays in the days ahead for Jesus. And he's aware. He's aware what's going to happen. Tell me about your bad week. I think of my last week or two, I think I've had sick kids and family, I've had a couple of board meetings, I'm taking on more responsibility, I've had interviews, I've had work, I've had people pulling and looking for a piece of my time, and, and in and amongst all of this, I've got to try and write a message for today, um, which I hope is going to be all right, because I think I wrote most of this last night. <laughs> But what does your last week look like in comparison to Jesus's? That's the only thing that kind of kept me sane this week was knowing that it could always be worse. Right? I'm having a bad week, but it could always be worse. Then I realized that what did Jesus do for me in his last week? I sometimes wonder whether I truly understand the depth of what he really did for me. As we head into Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, it kind of reminded me of a story in the Bible, and um, it's a great story. It's found in the book of John, and it's about death and life and love and the glory of God and belief, building on Dave's message of belief last week. We're going to look at a resurrection, but not the one that you think. We're going to look at a guy named Lazarus. He's talked about in uh, the book of John, Gospel according to St. Uh, John. Some of you might have Bibles that say St. John. John was an apostle. He was an eyewitness to everything Christ. His account was probably written some 90 days after uh, the resurrection of Jesus, 90 years. Did I say days? I don't know. This is the best gospel, I think. That if you're a brand new believer, uh, I believe that this is the best gospel for you to start with. This here uh, just lays out some solid, easy-to-read foundations about what Christ, the Christ follower life is all about and who Jesus was. So let's get into this and we'll see what kind of gold we can dig up today. We're going to start in John chapter 11. For those of you that have your Bibles out, those that want to pull out your phones and read along with me, we're going to have them up here too. So John chapter 11, uh, verse 1. And we're going to go through this whole chapter virtually, uh, almost all of it, and uh, because, you know, it's going to be kind of a drive-by, but it's, uh, there's so much stuff in here that you guys need to know today, and I feel that God just wants to share with you. So, now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. In verse 2, it says, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with hair. So this is just kind of interesting in verse 2 because this hasn't really happened yet. I think if you go through, uh, I think it's a couple more chapters away, uh, but, and we'll read in the next verse why this is so important uh, for, for John to put in here. And uh, so it goes on, it says, So uh, the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. And so love in here is just so amazing to hear. The one that you love is sick. When we go back to verse 2, it talks about, he's talking about a relationship. The one that you love. Now this is the Mary that loved you and I washed every your feet with, uh, or poured perfume on you and wiped your feet with my hair. It's talking about that relationship. But the Lord, the one that you love is sick. It doesn't say that the one that loves you is sick. It doesn't say that the one that prays to you all the time is sick. It doesn't say the one that read his Bible the most is sick. No, the motivation is different here. It says God is not motivated to help you based on your love for him, but on his love for you. His real motivation is that he loves you. Lord, the one you love is sick. I think I need a bigger desk here. I'll put that in the budget somewhere. Tammy, can you throw that in there? So when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness is not going to end in death. 
No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. It isn't about death here. It is about glory. Jesus already knows how this ends. But things have to happen in order for God to be glorified in this all. The sickness is not going to end in death. No, it is for God's glory. So the Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha. We see love a lot in here. And again, it's about that motivation. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now it may not sound like love when you read the next line here, but it's there. In verse 6, So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. That doesn't sound like love to me. But I think what's really important here, and I'll I'll touch on two points here. One is in verse 6, it says, so, so. So that means that we've got like a conjunction here. We've got some thoughts that are going to be changing here. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus so he stayed two more days. He loved them so much he stayed longer. I know it sounds weird, right? I love you. Just going to hang out here. But what we do need to know is that there's probably a bigger picture going on here. When Jesus said he loves you and he does something, it's because he knows what's going on. He has already seen, something has to happen. We've talked about that. Something has to be there in order for us to really completely understand. Sometimes I think, too, uh, that when we read something like this, I think sometimes we think about our life when we've asked God for some help and God hasn't answered. God hasn't responded. You feel that God's, like, taking some time off. And, he, and I'm just here to encourage you that sometimes God is not answering because you're not seeing the bigger picture, and he truly is. He knows what's best for you. He knows what needs to happen. Just need to let him do it. So sometimes he loves us so much that he doesn't do what we want him to do. I'm just going to jump to verse 11 here. Uh, and Jesus says, My friend Lazarus has uh, Lazarus. I don't know why I have a list, but uh, fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Why are we going to him? He needs rest. If you're saying he's sleeping, that's good. He's going to get better. How many people lay in bed when they're sick? Just to get better. The doctor says, go get some bed rest. Drink lots of fluids. I found that a little funny anyways. Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Why are we bothering him? So Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that uh, he meant... uh, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. We tend to try and finger, figure things out on, on our own um, intellect and, and sometimes filtering through our thoughts and what's going on in our life and we don't truly see what God is saying. The disciples thought that he was going to natural sleep um, because they really didn't understand what Jesus meant. And so we need, to, we need to change our mindset and stop filtering through all of our thoughts and intellect. And, and we just need to, to let God be God. We need to let God be God on our behalf for you. He's a good God. He's a great God. Verse 14, so then he told them plainly. He had to dub it down. Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. He's dead. And I'm glad I wasn't there because you need to believe. But let us go to him. Jesus is saying, I need to do this so you believe. I don't need you to understand. I don't need you to try to figure everything out. I need you to only believe. Believe that what I'm doing is going to be for the glory of God. He's just asking you to believe. Believe. 
Then Thomas, in verse 16, also known as Didymus, doubting Thomas, some of you may know him as, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Debbie Downer. Yeah, see, two of you got that there. Mm -hmm. This is like the Eeyore. I don't know if you guys watch Winnie the Pooh. Eeyore. Let us all go that we may die with him. I know, it kind of sounds silly, but no, there are two things here, and it's really important. One is that Jesus, Jesus was a wanted man, and so when we're talking about him, we're actually talking about Jesus here. Jesus is a wanted man. Uh, everywhere he kind of goes right now, uh, they're trying to hunt him down. They, they want to arrest him, and, and so let us all go that we might die with him was actually referencing that if all of us go, we're surely just signing a death warrant here. And um, do we really want to go? Well, I guess. Let us all go. <laughs> We're hanging out with the number one fugitive. The second point here is that uh, you need to be careful about who you have in your life. You don't need people like this in your life. People that are doubting you, people that are doubting God, people telling you what isn't or is good for you. And it's great having that opening video because you guys just need to realize that God, God is who you say you are. Doubting you, you don't need people to tell, doubting your future. So choose your friends carefully because they're gonna steal your dreams if you choose the wrong ones. They're gonna steal your future if you choose the wrong ones. Don't let that happen. The Bible says in Proverbs 13.20, and I don't have any slides for this, but walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fool suffers harm. 1 Corinthians 33, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God, and I say this is your, uh, to your shame. Just... Stay away from them. If you start seeing it, if you start seeing those people that are saying, well, I guess we're just going to go, you know, get away from them. Encourage them, maybe. Grow them. Show them the love of Christ and what it truly means to be a Christ follower. I don't have a very long message, people, so you guys are awesome. It's going to be great. You guys are going to be out of here in no time for lunch. Moving along. <laughs> you guys are supposed to say, it's not about lunch, right, people? We just learned that two weeks ago. So moving along, we're going to go on to verse 17 here. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Four days is really important here uh, because there was a belief uh, back in those days that uh, after you died, your spirit would kind of hover around you for about three days and then hit the road. And, and, and uh, so... I know, right? So Jesus wanted to make sure that all the people knew. This is why it was so important. Jesus so loved everybody that he waited two days, and it's because he needed to get to this fourth day, and he wanted to make sure that, uh, that uh, all the people knew that Lazarus was dead. His spirit was gone. Everything was gone. He was like dead, dead, like he was in there. And, and when you're talking about a warm country like this, a uh, countryside like this, like his body probably would have started decaying day one. I can't imagine what uh, day four would have been like. Uh, but uh, they bury them right away because they don't want them to decay. Sometimes the funerals are same day. So they just wanted to make sure that he was like dead, dead, super dead. That there was no hope of resuscitation here, decay and stink. So now Bethany was, just, was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha. They came for the wake. They came for the funeral. They came to hang out and offer their support and love and care for those that just lost a loved one. So they came to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet with him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha was super excited. She goes running out to meet Jesus to, yes, and there's Mary saying, you know what? You weren't here. I'm staying home. I can't deal with this. 
Why didn't Jesus come when I needed him the most? Kind of think that maybe she was angry. She didn't go to meet Jesus because she kind of had some issues. <clears throat> Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, things would have been amazing. You could have healed him and life would have moved on. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Martha seems to be expressing hope here. Lazarus is dead, but Lord, I know that you are here, and I have hope that something can change. Even after death, death isn't final. Lord, I know that there is something that can be done. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She reads her Bible. She understood that there is the last day and that he will rise. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. Jesus looked at her and said that this resurrection isn't an event. It isn't a day. It is me. I am the resurrection. I am the life. The one who, who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And here's the kicker. Do you believe this? It's a simple question. Do you believe this? Do you believe? Jesus is asking you today, do you believe that he is the resurrection and that he is the life? He's asking for some belief. You know what, in the end, in, in some day, we're always gonna, we're, we're gonna end up in a box. And, and there's my Debbie Downer moment, but we're all gonna end up in a box. But if we believe, we're just gonna have an amazing eternal life with, with, with a Father that loves us in heaven. This little time that we're here on earth is just this tiny little blip in comparison to what eternity is like. Some people may think, like, well, Lazarus, like he died. And, and for some of you know what may happen. We're all going to get there. We just need to believe. We just need to believe that he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus wants you to believe in him. Verse 27, yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into this world. And then after Martha had this moment, she went and told Mary, and go got, uh, went and got Mary and told her to go to Jesus. And we're going to skip a bit here. We're going to go to verse 32. Excuse me. I hope I'm not coming down with something. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Said the exact same thing that Martha said. Had you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Why weren't you here? Now he's dead. And what's interesting here is that what, Martha, uh, what Mary didn't say. Remember what Martha said? Martha spoke that even though you weren't here when he was sick, I still believe that you can do something after death. I still believe that you showed up and you can still have a change, Lord. You can still make a change even though I believe that death is final. And, 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 and Jesus is saying no. But Mary didn't say that. She just ended, Lord, had you been here, my, father, my brother wouldn't have died. Mary lacked hope. I get it, sometimes it's hard to have hope in the face of our death moments in life. Mary accepts that death is final and that's that. And I think all too often we give up too soon. We're expecting God to show up in our time of need, in our time of discouragement. And we go back to the original, that so moment where he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So he waited two more days. Change can happen 
We just need to believe. We just need to believe and know and understand that everything is to the glory of God. Everything is about our belief that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. All too often, I think we're just figuring out that, you know what, and maybe it's just time. Maybe it's just like, I can't even be bothered about this anymore. I have to move on. And um, what's done is done. So why even bother? So Jesus has to go see where they had laid Lazarus. Verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved. And now there was a lot of emotion in here. Jesus was moved, he wept. But he was more deeply moved. He came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Sounds pretty familiar. I jumped a few verses here, but Jesus was visually emotioned here. Um, upset about the ravages of death is what they believe, the reason why he was so deeply moved. The ravages of how death has affected us as a human race and uh, caused by, by sin entering the world. And, and uh, you know, he's moved by the loss of a, of a friend, one whom he loved. Jesus loves you. Verse 39, take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. Remember, Jesus wanted to make sure he was dead, dead. The King James Version is actually, I like how it says, he stinketh. (laughs) But Lord, it stinks in there. Don't open that up. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Now I hope you're catching this, that if you believe, you're going to see the glory of God. These guys are just hanging out saying, believe, because you're going to see something amazing just happening here. It's going to be awesome. So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. That you may believe, that they may believe that you sent me. You always hear me. It's it's, It's about them, that they believe. Jesus was doing this because he wants us to believe in him. Believe in him to see the glory of God, the change that he can have in life your life. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Then the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The supreme demonstration of the power of eternal life that triumphed over death and hopelessness. They just needed to believe. They needed to understand that God loves you. So he waited two days so you could see his glory in the end. The glory where he calls you out of your grave and says, come out. And take off your grave clothes. I I never, you know, as I've read through this before, I was just like, this is just amazing. Take off your grave clothes. What grave clothes are you wearing right now in your life that needs to come off so that way you can walk in God's glory? What grave clothes do you have? What sin is it in your life that's causing you to have grave clothes wrapped around you? Is it addiction? Is it porn? Is it alcohol? What is it? And all Jesus is saying, whatever it is, take them off and walk.
It's a simple question. I'm going to just go back to it. Do you believe? But it has profound implications, his belief. The belief in Jesus Christ. You know, this is amazing. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He didn't come to make bad people good. What he came to do was to make dead people come alive. He wants you to be alive. And all he's asking is just for you to believe in him so that way you can see God's glory. What God has planned for you in your life. <coughs> Do you believe?